Good evening. This is um, the introduction to the commentary on my translation of Thus Spake Zarathustra. And I just want to do this as sort of a rough draft of what will be the final commentary that will accompany the book, which will be facing page. So in the book, you'll have Nietzsche on one page and then commentary on one page. Uh, so I just wanted to work through some of the ideas that are likely to come up in that commentary. This is a rough draft, but um, probably most of the ideas that I present here will make it into the final version. So hopefully you've been enjoying uh, Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, and hopefully you'll enjoy the commentary, or at least it will help uh, clarify some of the issues. So first, why? Why do a new translation and why do a commentary on Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra? It's been translated uh, several times already. There's several excellent translations. I particularly like the Oxford Classic uh, translation. Also, the Kaufman is quite famous. Um, the primary reason is I love the work and I wanted to do it. It's something that's been on my mind for many years. And I finally said, well, let's just do it. <clears throat> but second, I think the other translations, which are, again, fine translations, are um, leave an opportunity for there to be increased clarity. And I'll talk about why that is um, a little later. But I think the key issue here is that some of the decisions they made in translating while are, are accurate, but not always helpfully clear. And so in my case, I want to make it as clear as possible um, because what I found was because over the years, I love this work so much. People have asked me, oh, what's the, your favorite work or what should I read? And I'm, my, the first thing that pops in my head is always, thus spake Zarathustra. You know, let's do that one, read that one. And then when people do read it, I often get back this <clears throat> sort of uh, complete disbelief. Like, what is this? I have no idea what's going on. This is so confusing. I can't follow it. And so at first I'm like, oh, well, they're, you know, it's blame the blame the victim essentially of course always the first step is make them go oh well that person just doesn't get it or whatever and then the more i thought about it, the more i realized yeah there are several problems um, when one approaches this text first as i mentioned with the translation um the for instance nietzsche was working very hard to make fun of and mock the tone of Luther's Bible. So the, the, the influence of Luther on the German language, particularly at Nietzsche's lifetime, was massive. It was like Shakespeare, maybe even more than Shakespeare on the English language. And so everybody, every literate German, uh, you know, basically would, be, would know Luther's Bible and would know the sound of it, and know the language, and know the way it's structured and all of this. And so uh, Nietzsche goes out of his way in many places and consistently in tone and structure to sort of echo that and mimic that. And, and, and so when translating this into English, earlier translators, Kaufman, etc., often use sort of the language from the English equivalent of this, which is the King James Bible. Now, several generations ago, every literate American would know the King James Bible. They would have gone to church. I mean, you would be very familiar to them. Again, this is what Whitman is doing, by the way, in much of his poetry. He, his structure is, is uh, echoing off and creating tension with uh, the King James Bible, um, the way he's structuring his lines and poetic devices that he uses. What's happened, though, is the as generations have passed, that influence has become increasingly less clear until today. I would say most people are not familiar with the sound, tone, structure, language of the King James Bible. <clears throat> and so trying to translate those resonances make no sense because they don't actually, because they just don't make it across the divide because we don't even have the reference in English anymore. So it's, it just pointly creates more confusion. So part of that confusion just comes from that sort of, which is a perfectly good, reasonable and accurate translation decision, but often uh, makes passages much less clear than they otherwise would be. However, as the title says, I did keep the spake Zarathustra, which is a very King James kind of phrase. We don't say spake anymore. We say spoke, uh, of course. And we don't use thus quite like that very often. But the King James Bible, that's the biblical language right there. But it's so common and so well known. It's such a beautiful phrase that I couldn't, you know, couldn't let go of it. But generally speaking, abandon those, that kind of usage in favor of something that would be much clearer. <clears throat> Another thing I ran into is the commentary in many of these translations, Kaufman and uh, the Oxford and others, is unbelievably unhelpful for the general reader. And I hate to say that because the commentary is great 
for me. Uh, someone who spends their time, absurd amount of their time thinking about philosophy, philosophical history, literary issues. And so, you know, they'll give you a footnote that talks about some issue in the Luther's Bible, for instance, since we were just discussing that from, you know, 1690, you know, it goes back and back. And for their general reader, this is, they, they are more confused after they've read the footnote than before they read the footnote, right? This doesn't clarify the issue. They're like, okay, you're, now you've mentioned two books other books that Nietzsche wrote and other passages, and I've not read those. So now I not only do I not understand the Nietzsche book I'm reading at the moment, I really now I have to read two other books that I'm probably not going to understand to try and be more confused. Yeah, see, this is unhelpful. So uh, in the commentary, I want to really lean the other direction and like, hey, let's try and make this as clear as possible. Um, so I, I actually absolutely want to emphasize that both in the commentary and again in the translation. So the, the commentary for the non-specialist and the translation for clarity. Uh, another issue that you run into is there's a lot of controversy even in the philosophical community about the value of Thus Begs Zarathustra. So you have someone like Kaufman who will say, you know, this is one of the classics of world literature. Of course, I lean heavily in that direction. However, a philosopher I like, Alinda Bataan, he, he's out there saying, that's, don't read that book, right? So like that book is just a confusing mess. Don't read it. And I, you know, I understand why he would say that. There's several issues with the way uh, Nietzsche presents Thus Begs Zarathustra that run very much counter to what our expectations are for when we read a philosophical work. Um, number one, it's presented as a series of narratives or short, short moments or interludes and parables. So even in a structure, it's not quite, you know, what we would expect. It's not paragraphs making clear arguments, scenes and moments and conversations. Um, but overall, I think besides the translation and the commentary issue, uh, some of the surprising and unexpected elements and why I wanted to do the translation again uh, is one, that it's not one book. It's, I can't find a four volume version of this, but these are four different books. And so I've talked to people and they've said, oh, you know, I thought I was doing pretty well. And then at some point in the second book, I just, I was completely lost. I'm like, oh, that's right. Because you always get it bound together as one book. And that's why I want to break it out into four books because they are four separate and actually in some ways quite different books. And so talking about them as one book is hmm, slightly to very misleading, particularly book four, which is just... You know, we'll get there, but it's completely off. I mean, book four is crazy. Uh, it's great. It's wonderful, but it's really different again. So, you know, that so encountering all four of them at once as if they're a single thing, just that structurally, I think, has misled many people into feeling lost. I made it through the first book. I thought I was doing well. And then they say second book, but because it's bound together, you feel like, oh, this is just a continuation. This is another chapter or, you know, it's part two, part three. That's, no, it's book one, book two, book three, book four, and the books are different. So that's why I want to bind them separately. So it's four separate volumes in the, in the collection. Um, second, the, the way Nietzsche voices Zarathustra is not as the prophet coming out of the wilderness, although there is some of that. That's part of the voice of Zarathustra. But much, not all, because it's a very complex work, much of what's happening is a conversation. So he says consistently to the reader, he says, look or see or feel or hear or haven't you felt? And so he appeals directly to the reader and, and says, have you not seen? Have you not heard? Have you not felt this? So he's not saying, here's an argument. He's saying, look at your own experience. Look at your own thoughts. Look at your own feelings. And, and let's talk about that. Is this not what you felt? Is this not what you've seen? Is this not how you've experienced the world? And so it's, it has this interrogatory tone and, and structure in many, many sections that really invites conversation. He means this. It's not, it's not a rhetorical, I mean, it is a rhetorical device, of course, but it's not just a rhetorical device. It's also an invitation to a conversation, which is an unusual. You know, Kant was not saying, well, let's think about the various structures of the categorical imperative and how you feel about that, inviting you to be a participant. But many of the scenes, many of the settings, and much of the language asks you to be a witness with Zarathustra 
and then talk to him about what you've seen and felt and heard. And so it's uh, sort of triangulated between Zarathustra, the prophet, um, you as a spectator with Zarathustra, and then your own feelings and your own experiences. Um, and that can be misleading because we're saying, well, what is he saying? And, and often what Zarathustra slash Nietzsche is saying is, hey, what do you think? And, and so if you don't fill in some of those blanks, then it's like, well, this is very confusing. Well, it's very confusing because um, you're not filling in the, the missing bits. Uh, you're not participating in the conversation because you're not used to it. It's not a failure on the reader's part, by the way. It's just a very different work. And once you get that into your mind, that you're being invited as an equal to share with uh, Zarathustra rather than being talked down to, although that happens as well, both happen, but often it is this conversational mode then it's like, oh, I've got to bring a lot more to this work. I'm allowed to, invited to, but also responsible for. So, it's, you know, it's all, all three at the same time um, to, to engage in a very different and I think more profound and exciting, exhilarating, inspirational way than a normal philosophical text. <clears throat> Second, uh, the narrator, Zarathustra, learns and grows and changes his mind both within each book and, and, of course, between the books is unquestionable. But even within the books, Zarathustra has moments of inspiration, gets confused, changes his mind, uh, decides that he's wrong. I mean, you know, so we're, we're not, again, we're expecting, and you know, even in a sort of allegorical narrative of philosophy, oh, there's a consistent tone, there's a central argument, the person is going to present this, and I'm going to follow along, and I'm going to get it. And then what you get is Zarathustra, theoretically the prophet coming out of the mountains, who goes, mm, oh, wait a second, let me rethink that. Oh, I was sleeping, and I had a new inspiration, and uh, a vision came to me, and forget everything I just told you, let's move on to something else. And so you don't have this consistent, straightforward, point-by-point -point presentation of information. Again, you have the sort of process where you participate in Zarathustra's education. Uh, it's sort of a Bildungsroman, philosophical Bildungsroman for a prophet, who we usually expect to come out with the truth, right? That's what a prophet is, someone who comes out of the wilderness with the truth, big T, truth. Zarathustra comes out of the wilderness with sort of um, some questions, some observations, some ideas, some truths, but uh, also mind-changing, grows, has inspiration, double backs. You know, it's, it's, it's a much more complex narrator than we're expecting, or I think than we're used to. And finally, he uses a lot of imagery, and he uses it inconsistently, so it's not allegorical. So there's almost this an irresistible impulse to go, oh, this is a very powerful, he's got some great images, the snake and the eagle, we'll talk about that, that, that he invokes, and we go, oh, so what a great imagery, so beautiful, so poetic, and we want to make it a strict allegory to some idea or some concept so that then we can keep track of it. This is, again, perfectly reasonable on, part of the, on the reader. This is not a crazy thing for the reader to try to do, but it's not allegorical. This, this, it's just, it does not hold up to allegorical analysis. And so he sort of uses the imagery, which I think he just falls in love with, however he wants at any moment. So it's, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I was using it in this way, but now in this context, you can see that it's sh shifted either subtly or often completely. And that's confusing because, wait, just like 10 pages ago, the snake was here and it was doing this. Now we have another snake and then later the snake comes back, but it's not the snake. that you know. So like, what do you do with all these snakes? And, and they're being used in different ways. And are, is that is the snake one thing or is the snake many things? So it's many things, by the way, is the correct answer there. But it's, for the reader, again, very confusing. You know, the snake, what does it mean? You write it down in your notes. You go, great, good to go. And then you hit the snake again. You go, wait, was I wrong before? Am I missing in something in this passage, or is the snake changed? And it could be any of those above. I mean, you don't know because that's a complicated work. So I think those issues, the, the conversational style, the fact that the narrator moves, changes, and grows in his own mind as we go through this, and the fact that the imagery, which is both powerful and evocative, is also shifting throughout, creates a, a, truly a work that needs support. The reader needs a little help. It is a challenge to read, I finally decided, more more than I would have thought on on first passing. And that is why, of course, I want to do the commentary to hopefully help uh, a little bit 
um, the reader sort of see some of this happening and then they can go, oh yeah, okay, I feel more comfortable because I would argue that most of the writing here is very simple. What's confusing is the arguments run counter to our expectations. So that's one kind of confusing. Something that's clearly written and simply written but what it's saying is difficult to digest is a different kind of confusing than much of philosophy. Much of philosophy consists of relatively straightforward, um, even if complex and subtle, arguments presented in unbelievably abstruse fashion. So, of course, you know, Kant being the all-time captain of this team, Hegel not helping at all, you know, Heidegger, good Lord, Sartre, you know, to take a bow. It, it, it's, you run into this over and over again, the profound ideas, brilliant insights, beautiful reasoning wrapped in this just opaque language and extensive systems. And no, like, we do, does it have to be that way? So that's a different kind of confusion. I would say that, again, the confusing nature of Thus Spake Zarathustra, rather, is things that are written simply and clear and beautifully, if I can capture that in the translation, I hope I can, but it is beautiful, but so runs counter to our cultural training, our, our, our predispositions, our assumptions, that it actually sort of traps our thinking, stops us uh, short. We don't know what to make of it, which, again, is a, a different and, I think, a, a, an important kind of confusing to recognize because it means the work that you're having to do is against your own uh, presuppositions. It doesn't make Nietzsche right. It just means that it's causing you to question and reflect. And that's a very difficult thing to do, no doubt. Um, note on translation, the one I want to make, of course, is on Ubermensch. So this is a word that is, you know, famous, was famously translated as Superman, People have translated it as overman. Some people have left it untranslated as ubermensch. Um, and it just has to be addressed, so I'm going to address it and say, I'm using overman because that's a literal translation of the word that Nietzsche uses in German, which is ubermensch. And the reason I just want to use overman and not superman is because all the connotations of superman are wrong. <clears throat> it's not a superhero. There's nothing about this that invokes the sort of, uh, you know, modern superhero character that's so popular in our culture today. So the resonances that were not there, you know, 70, 80 years ago are here now, and that's very misleading. Also because Superman is a word in English, and Ubermensch is not really a word in German. I mean, it is a word in German, but it's not, it, 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 Nietzsche made this word up, basically. And there is no definition. He does not define the U U Ubermensch. He never tells you what it is. He does not consider either himself or Zarathustra to be the Ubermensch. So, so we don't have a model for what the Ubermensch is or who the, the Overman is supposed to be. And basically, the context of what it means to be the Overman shifts and changes, both throughout book one and throughout each book. So it seems best to me, there is no word overman in English. I mean, we know what it means, the overman. But basically to use a word that has no clear definition captures the sense very much better of how Nietzsche is using it in the texts because there is no clear definition. And I think this is another thing people find confusing is they're waiting like, okay, this is all about the overman. Who is the overman? What does he do? What size shoes does he wear? You know, what time does he get up in the morning and what does he eat? And that never is going to come because it's, Nietzsche is not clear that he knows what he means, um, but it's clear that he never tells us what he means. If he does know, he never communicates it to us. So that it's just this goal or concept that floats out there that he wants to explore but we never get a clear definition. So to me, the best approach there seems to be just to use the literal translation uh, Ubermensch into Overman because there's no such word in German really and there's no such word in English. So that works very well for a word that has no clear definition. It's just a, a concept that floats around. Finally, why illustrations? So this book will, uh, all, the, all four books will be illustrated by Axel Void. And if you've seen a few samples already on the YouTube clips there, one, well, if you get a chance to work with an artist uh, of the quality of Axel Void, the answer is yes, just do it because only good things can happen. 
Second, I really like the ideas of, of the idea of illustrations because they're not literal and they give you that inspiration in the irrational that Nietzsche talks about so much, right? That he, he tries to invoke this. He does it with the language of, of that Zarathustra speaks, some of the examples he uses. And so I really like the idea of having one more element that might just spark something in your mind or spark a feeling or a memory or a sensation that may open up an aspect of the work that no amount of clear arguing or, or translating is ever going to do because I, I do think there is a power uh, to, the, to imagery um, that's attached that makes it very helpful or at least potentially helpful. So I thought it was just an element to sort of shake the work up a little bit, give it a new context, give it a, a new frisson, something to have a, a tension with that might help clarify various ideas for people. So, hence the purpose of this work is simply to bring more clarity and uh, illumination and illustrations to a work that at first I was a little surprised people struggled with so much, but upon actual honest reflection, I realized, no, this really is a quite challenging work, but one I find, and I think you'll find, very much worth the effort. Zarathustra's Prologue. Now, the story opens with Zarathustra um, going up into the mountains, meditating for 10 years, and then returning um, to deliver a new message. Now, this is, of course, a classic trope of many holy men, wise men, philosophers, prophets have wandered off into the desert or the mountains, the wastelands, to return with a message to the people. So that's that's pretty obvious. But I think a question we need to ask is, A, who is Zarathustra and why would uh, Nietzsche pick Zarathustra? Of course, this is the, this is the name Zoroaster from the founder of Zoroastrianism. And part of that is just Nietzsche wrote this under inspiration. He, he was inspired. He had a vision basically of the entire book. It kind of sprang to his mind, and he wrote it very quickly indeed, particularly compared to his normal uh, writing process, which tended to be taking a lot of notes and rewriting and editing. But this one just really seemed to come to him, and he wrote it out very swiftly, or, or the main parts, the main structure of it. And so I think Partly it was just a, an inspiration that this prophet of old, the prophet who had created monotheism, uh, essentially, uh, has, has come back to maybe bring a new message for a new time and, and perhaps correct some of the errors that were delivered in the, in the earlier version of his preaching. And so is this like the return, which will come up again and again, this, this vision of the return is certainly there. But I, I think it's important not to take things too literally because, again, Nietzsche did do this work uh, basically from uninspiration, from a flash of insight. And so it's not like he had done lots of deep thinking and research about Zor Zoroastrianism and Zarathustra and going, oh, okay, you know, I, I want to have some sort of specific structural changes. And it's not that sort of mode. It's like, oh, imagine, imagine this character comes back. Oh, great. Let's go. Let's roll with that. So I think it was a much more of an inspirational issue, but that's who Zarathustra is, is the, the, the prophet of Zoroastrianism returned to teach again. Now you notice a um, couple, I mean, there's so much here going on, of course, but he goes in the mountains and there he has his eagle and the snake. Uh, and again, these images will recur and don't, there's not, there's not an allegorical work, but clearly in the way he uses it, the eagle is our highest and our snake is the lowest aspects of ourselves. And Nietzsche, of course, wants to jumble this up all the time and he wants us to get beyond our lowest and our highest, but he doesn't want to leave them behind. They play important parts later on. You know, they are not, the snake is not bad and the eagle is not good, uh, you know, beyond good and evil. He's trying to incorporate them and include them and whatever is to come. And so they're, they're, they're a crucial aspect and we'll travel with them throughout these works. So, you know, get there, there, I think, again, one of the great images, one of the great visions that he creates is the snake and the eagle who are friends and who, who are his companions and helpers in various ways at various times. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. So he re, he, whatever insight he's received he decides to travel back down uh, to the valley and then down the going up and going down also needs to be commented on here because it's going to be going over, going across, going under recurs. And again, the snake low, eagle high. 
generally speaking, going down refers to either a literal descent, but also metaphorically, usually going into yourself, going inside or coming down to the earth. Uh, and going over or above uh, or beyond tends to things that are above or beyond you. And so there, he often uses, not invariably, but often uses this as a metaphor for doing things that are inside of you and then taking that outside of you. So that playing that, you know, lots of wisdom is to be found inside, but a lot of wisdom is to be found outside. Experiences are inside, but experiences are outside. And so, you know, he, he plays this off against each other. And so sometimes going down simply means to go inside of yourself um, or to go down to what are considered, you know, the basis of yourself. And then to go up or to overcome often means to overcome aspects of ourself. And he uses both. So there's no, you know, there's no escape from this really, except perhaps the, the overman. But that, that, is, that process and that language will recur throughout the text. So in this case, we're going down, we're going back down from the heights to the valleys where the regular people are, the, the sort of unwashed masses, as it were. And on the way, he encounters this monk. And this is where we get the famous God is dead phrase. Has he not heard that God is dead? If you have heard one line from Nietzsche, that's probably it. Um, and what's important here is you have this holy hermit, which is really hard to translate. It's this concept of it's not just a hermit out in the woods. It's, it's a holy man who's living as a hermit out in the woods. And this is a classic medieval uh, person. I mean, it's it just it was totally common. A Russian Orthodox church had a lot of this. It's just they were everywhere. You, you know, you wanted to go back, go out into the wilderness. You wanted to meditate with God. You wanted to do basically what Zarathustra had done at the top of the mountain. And he encounters this hermit who's out there praising God and making songs and rooting for vegetables and living this very humble life. And, and, and the monk says to him, you know, Zarathustra, don't go to the town. They don't want to hear you. They, they absolutely do not want your gifts. You're going to just, it, it's not going to work. These people are not for you. Better to take something from them than to try and give something to them. Uh, this kind of argument. And Zarathustra listens to this and they sort of have a laugh together, which is important to note that there are funny sections in this book. And then as he's walking off, he says, you know, uh, how can it be? Has he not heard that God is dead? <clears throat> and in this case, he means specifically that God, that medieval God, that old pattern of faith that informed these sorts of ways of life it is the modern world. He's, he's dead. The Enlightenment, um, those sorts of movements, industrialization has killed off that God kind of God. It's not that people don't still believe in religion. Religion still exists. There is some sort of faith in God, but it's not that medieval faith that no longer exists. And so when, when Nietzsche says God is dead, he means this sort of unquestioned medieval faith that allowed people to structure their lives in this particular way. And he's like, wow, no, that just doesn't exist anymore. And this crazy, you know, hermit in the woods just hasn't heard about it yet. And so it's a, he's invoking a pretty specific concept when he says uh, God is dead. He means that that real deep medieval faith version. And so then he heads down to the town and he goes to the marketplace where all of the specific that is the marketplace, by the way, this will recur again. He just means the, the gathering hordes of the masses. And he begins to preach to them and he begins to preach as a classic prophet mode. He begins to preach the message of the overman. And again, it's not really clear what the overman is. He says, you know, the overman is the sense of the earth. Let your will say the overman is the sense of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain true to the earth and do not believe those who talk of unnatural hopes. They are poison mixers, whether they know it or not. And he, and he goes on in this m mode of, of, you know, believe in the overman. The overman is coming. I am the lightning. The overman is the lightning. I am the, the harbinger of the lightning. You know, what does it mean to have a sense of the earth? It's clear, you know, reject this notion of heaven and reject this notion of the otherworldly. Of, of there's something more important than the, the body and the here and now, is just reject all that. But exactly what the overman is, again, not that clear. But the reason everyone is gathered is they're waiting for this tightrope walker to appear. And as uh, Zarathustra is lecturing the crowd, he, he keeps giving them different messages. You know, I love him who makes his virtue his addiction and his undoing. And for his virtue, he wants more life and no more life. I love him who does not have too many virtues. One virtue is more than two. 
you know, he, he, he's preaching this. Why one virtue more than two? Because it makes you, it clarifies your thinking. If you only have one virtue that you steer by, say uh, a belief in beauty or a belief in the earth, you know, then it then it clarifies and and makes things simpler, even if it makes them harder in some ways. And and he ends with, "Behold, I am the herald of the lightning and a heavy drop from the cloud. This lightning is called the Overman." And then he realizes, "Well, this isn't working. They're laughing at me." They're not listening. I'm not the the voice for these ears. You know, and they start just railing against him. And so he starts railing against them. And he makes them both nervous, um, but mostly they just laugh at him and think, well, who's this funny prophet come from the mountains? Now, this is not surprising because this crazy guy has just come down from the mountains after 10 years of meditation. And he starts, you know, yelling at us about the, about the overman. And you realize that, and, and Zarathustra realizes, oh, this isn't working. Again, this is one thing that makes the book difficult because we don't generally think of our, you know, prophet narrator or the philo- philosophical voice as coming down and going, here's what's true, here's what's true, here's what I'm saying, uh, hey, this doesn't work, you guys aren't listening, I don't know why I'm talking anymore, this is kind of getting scary and dangerous, huh? Maybe I need to rethink this whole thing, right? But that's that's what starts to happen. And then, of course, you get the amazing event of the tightrope walker uh, and the jester demon devil who who leaps over him and then causing the tightrope walker to fall to his death. And, and of course, this is both imagery, which is to say to travel from where we are, an animal, to the overman means we have to do this dangerous crossing. And so we are the tightrope walkers. That's one way to read this. But the other part of this also is then who is this uh, jester who overleaps us and knocks us off? Clearly, partly this is an image of those things that we carry with us that throw us off and, and, and can scare us. Partly this is unknowable, right? This is just an image, a vision that he had. I think it's powerful and evocative, but is there a single answer? I don't think so. But I think it's also important to note that he's mocking Zarathustra. He's trying to push the guy across the rope, and you can't push a tightrope walker, right? Zarathustra is saying, I'm here to lead you across the rope. I'm going to push you across the bridge, and we're all going to get to the overman, and it's going to be great. Um, and then he sort of sees the jester doing the same thing, and this, of course, simply just causes people to fall off the rope to their doom. And so Zarathustra sits with him, and says, I respect you because you lived a life of danger and I'll bury you with my own hands. And so he ends up walking out of the city, there's more scenes, of course, uh, into the wilderness, carrying a corpse. Now, this is both hilarious and, and also, I think, quite poignant <laughs> that he went into the town to convert the people, show them a better way, and lead them uh, to a path towards the overman, whatever that is. And he ends up leaving the city with one follower who's a corpse. And that is this, the, like you can think of this as the humbling of Zarathustra, who realizes, wow, have I gone wrong? Have I really just, this has not worked out for me at all. And that is, I think, again, one thing that throws us off when we read this, because we're not used to encountering people or encountering the philosophical narrative voice that actually sort of says, oh, I've got to rethink this. I've got to start again. I've got to begin anew what I was doing and and try and imagine a different approach because this is clearly not working. And so he lays down in the forest and sleeps. And when he wakes, he's had a new vision, a new beginning. And he says, you know, I need to seek those who are co-creators. I don't need to seek followers. I don't need to seek the masses. I need to seek those who are seeking the same way I am. And he then sees his animals, right? There's there's his, his eagle and his snake have been out looking for him. And he finds this inspiration and he goes, ah, there they are. They're, the wi- they're wiser than me, right? I should be wise like my snake, but well, I'm probably not going to be able to do that. So I'll just have to do the best I can. You know, so it's a very interestingly humble beginning to this work. And I th- it bears reflecting on that Nietzsche begins this 
uh, narrative as one where our prophet, our spokesperson, our philosophical leader errs and errs pretty significantly, but thinks, reflects, gains new insight and heads out again. And that dynamic Uh, I think, again, throws off the reader who is expecting a clear, unbroken series of arguments that present a a message that we can then decipher and follow. But it's a bit surprising, but I also think quite moving and inspirational for Nietzsche to start off by going, oh, look, I've erred. And partly this is also autobiographical. Much of this work is because it's pretty clear that originally Nietzsche thought that his works would reach a wide audience, that, oh, I've got these incredible philosophical insights. I'll publish them in books and send them out. And then, you know, I'll be famous like Kant or Hegel. And um, I'll have lots of readers and people will be inspired. And this is going to be great. And what he found out was no one had the vaguest notion of how to listen to him or take him in. Um, And this remained true pretty much throughout his life. He never did really find an audience. So, you know, he actually sort of enacted this and then woke up one morning and went, oh, I'm going about this the wrong way. I need to search for co-creators, not try to reach uh, the general public. And so this begins, as he says, his going under. My, oh, now I've really got to begin again. I've been humbled. I've got to rethink. And now I'm going to start again. And that begins the next section, which are Zarathustra's speeches. And now, again, very odd, we get a change. The tone and structure of the narrative had now switches from what is almost novelistic, or at least scene by scene by scene, to just a series of loosely related, at best, uh, intervals where it's not a clearly developed scene. Lots of internal dialogue, lots of reflecting, but the narrative is sort of mostly gone. A tiny bit will return. But so again, I think one thing that makes this a confusing work is we've just had Zarathustra's prologue, which works in one kind of narrative structure, and we're about to jump over into the speeches, which work in pretty much an entirely different way. Zarathustra's speeches on the three transformations. Um, boy, I love this one. I, I just have to say, I, I love many, many of the speeches, but this is just one of, one of the best ones. And he says, the three transformations of the spirit I named for you, how the spirit becomes a camel and the camel a lion, and finally the lion a child. And each of these steps I think is pretty clear, and I think he articulates it very clearly, but it, it's hard, again, for us to understand often because it runs counter to our, 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 our training, our thought processes, our cultural presuppositions. Um, and so the camel, how do we become a camel? And he says, we're not a camel from weakness. We're not a camel from some error. We're a camel because we're strong. And strong people want to feel weight, right? If you have power, you want to use it. And so, of course, the weight is just an, a metaphor for having, you can do something, you want the, you want the power, you want your power and your abilities and your, your, your capacities to be tested, So you take on burdens, you take on challenges. But generally those challenges that you take on may or may not be of your own selecting. So then you head out into the desert. So you head out in the desert as a camel carrying these burdens because carrying the burdens make you feel good because they, this is your power. Look how powerful I am. I can carry all this. I can, I can, I can transport it with me. I can make this happen. I'm, I'm strong. See me in my full glory of strength. And then someplace in the desert you realize that, oh, you have to transform into a lion. And you have to be a lion because you now have to fight a battle. To stop being a camel, you have to kill the thou shalt and make an I will. That's very difficult. Why is something worth doing? Why bother translating uh, Zarathustra's work or Nietzsche's work? I will, right? That transformation of saying, if I'm going to carry a weight, I'm only going to carry the weights that I want to carry. I'm not, I don't care what I'm supposed to do, what my responsibilities are. I, I want to choose. It's, it's going to be, I will. So if you've listened to people's language, what they'll say is, oh, I have to work. Even if they like their jobs, they'll say, I have to work, which is the thou shalt. 
And, you know, this is an amazing, big, powerful, deadly dragon that must be slain. And it must be slain by the I will, not because I have to, but because I want to. I want to go to work. I enjoy working or I want to do this. You know, why is this? Why are you doing that? Because I want to. Why else would anybody do anything? But even when people are doing things they like to do, we tend to have this um, cultural training that says, no, you always want to pretend as if you're being made to do things because otherwise, I'm not sure otherwise what, but it just doesn't sound as good, right? It doesn't, it's, it's not uh, as, as valuable somehow. The, the wanting to do things versus the having to do things. Oh, you have to do this. Oh, okay, well then I understand because you don't have a choice. Even though when you pause, you go, no, really, you do have a choice. You're just making that particular choice. And so actually transferring in your mind and your heart and your, and your language from I have to do things to I want to do things. I'm doing the things I will to do is slaying the dragon of thou shalt. Um, which is, of course, huge. This is the, the major overcoming. And then, but that lion, he says, then needs to become the child. And per, this is perhaps the most elusive and difficult concept. But the idea is children do things spontaneously. That's the idea. It, you want to be spontaneous. You want to be joyful. You want it to be play. You want things to happen just because they're fun. Let's just do it because it's fun and you're going to enjoy it and make it playful. So not I will in a like aggressive, like er sense of like, oh, I'm going to be mighty and I'm going to enforce my will on things. But what you need to do to slay the dragon, but then to turn that into a, uh, a playful, open-hearted, fun, laughing, dancing, joyful, singing kind of I will. Oh, that's to become the child. And that is you know, very difficult indeed, of course. And yeah, duh, so tricky. So that first speech, I think, is hugely valuable and quite moving. Uh, and if you just think of those three steps from, you know, responsibility and burden, not from weakness, though, but because you that feels good to carry that, then to the liberating yourself and then liberating yourself again into joy and happiness and play. Whew. That's a tough one, but the three transformations. On the chair of virtue. Now, this is this is one of those difficult to translate concepts because on the chair of virtue, it, it has the connotation of being both a position and a person. So like being a chairman. So you would have a chair. So it's like the, he, the, this actually refers to a person who is themselves the chair of virtue. And Nietzsche does some wordplay with this. It's very difficult to translate. But it just means the, the person who is officially identified as, as the knowledgeable of and is, inhabits the chair. That is, virtue as an official position. And this is a great example of a dialogue that I've had many conversations with people where they get confused because the chair of virtue is saying, here's all the things you need to do to sleep well. You need to reconcile yourself with the day. You need to avoid doing bad things. You need to be at peace with your neighbors. Right? He goes through this whole list because what you really want to do is get a good night's sleep and good sleep. Uh, it means good health. And so, wow, chair of virtue is preaching for us to be, um, to be well and be healthy and to sleep well. And then you'll be, you know, you'll be wise and it'll be, you'll be, you'll have virtue. This is the nature of virtue. And he says, not too much wealth. You don't want to be too poor. So it gets these nice messages of moderation and self-reflection and sleeping well and so on and so forth. And that all sounds really good. However, what's odd is Zarathustra just, as he says, when Zarathustra heard the wise man speak thus, he laughed in his heart because a light had dawned on him and he spoke to his heart thus. What a fool is this wise man with his 40 thoughts. But I think he well understands how to sleep. So Zarathustra is saying, oh yeah, he knows how to sleep. But and, and then we go, wait, all much of this advice that sounds pretty reasonable and decent, Zarathustra is just laughing at. Um, what, what can that mean? And what's clear here is sleeping well is an important part of health. But is it's a it's a unworthy goal essentially? I would say is how he's thinking about it. If you only if you always sleep well, Nietzsche su suspects that you're not ever wrestling with yourself. If you always sleep well, you're not um, you know challenging yourself. You're not you're not risking. There's no danger, and that and so he thinks that it's unworthy of someone. 
basically to only ever try and make sure life is unruffled and their sleep is undisturbed. Better if you're living a life that occasionally causes you to be awake all night wondering what are you doing to ask those questions in the long watches of the night. I'm sure we've all been there where you're going, you know, what is happening? What is my life? What is going on with me? Nietzsche suggests that if you're not doing that, if you never, you probably don't want to do that every night, but if you never do that, also something is wrong. And so all this advice that sounds so good, and people have said this to me, oh, wow, this all sounds like good advice and sleeping well. It's like, yes and no, right? If, if your goal in life is to be a sleeper, then it's excellent. The chair of virtue has it just right. If you have higher ambitions, then you're probably going to be threatened. You're going to feel unnerved. You're going to feel afraid. You're going to feel doubt. And those things are going to keep you awake at least some nights. And that's not a bad thing. That's, in fact, an expected thing. And if you're not doing that, Nietzsche thinks, who? You're probably missing out on a lot. So I think this is a classic example of something that's very clear, but it's hard to read because so much of the other advice seems so compelling. Um, yet, it, it implies that your goal is good sleep rather than uh, higher objectives that Nietzsche thinks you should be searching for. 